This is The Resilient Life, where we believe that every human will struggle in this life. Our challenge is to struggle well. I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war, my mom to cancer, and I'm the daughter of a retired Marine. I'm also a wife, mom, author, and president of one of the nation's leading veteran service organizations. Join me and some incredible guests as we explore the value of struggling well through life's inevitable challenges. Welcome to another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. Like I said, I am thrilled to have our guests today, actresses both on the new CBS sitcom, United States of Al, Liz Aldifer and Kelly Goss. Welcome to the Resilient Life. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Hi. Thank <laughs> you so much for having much. us. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. Uh, as, as we were saying before, our mutual friend Chase uh, connected both of you with me. And uh, I, you know, I, I was hearing about the United States of Al, um, heard about uh, the project that he was working on. I was so excited as, mm-hmm. you know, growing up in a military family that there was another show that was coming out that had that depiction in it. And, and I loved the idea that it was a comedy too. Um, but I was able to sit down last night and watch, uh, all three episodes and, you know, kind of dive into where you guys are within the series and Elizabeth or Liz, I'll start with you. So there's, there was a lot of talk about the United States of Al before it premiered. And now a few people, few episodes have aired and Mm -hmm. there's definitely, you know, there's a lot to say about it. Um, And, you know, people are talking, which is good. And that's a great thing. I I wanted to hear from you, like what drew you to the role? And and you play the sister of a Marine. um, Mm -hmm. And you're also playing a gold star fiance. Your fiance was killed um, as a pilot. So as an actress, you get this script put in front of you. What, what draws you to that? Well, the first, my first reaction to it was actually through my husband. He, I forget what the circumstances were, but I was crazy busy and he was like trying to take something off my plate and he read it. Um, and he comes from an immigrant family. His, his father comes from Iran and a lot of his cousins are from Iran and Syria. And he said, oh my gosh, the immigrant experience that is being depicted here is so on point. It's so fresh. It's something I've never seen, especially on network TV. Um, so he was really excited about it from, from that point of view. And then when I finally got a chance to read it myself, um, you know, just like most of Chuck Lorre's shows, our, our executive, one of our executive producers, Chuck Lorre, I mean, he does not, he does not shy away from you know, the realness of life, you know, just because it's a comedy um, doesn't mean there aren't moments of gravity and really serious issues. So it's just, it's such a unique opportunity always to work with him because um, all of his characters are rich like this. Like, yes, it's a comedy, but also they're going through a lot of trauma. Also they're, um, exploring the American, culture through this new point of view through Al's eyes. It was just like, it was so rich and so deep and, and yeah, to do that with a comedy a network comedy, no less, just was super impressive. Yeah. I I thought about that too. When I first heard of the concept of uh, the show, it was an Afghan translator coming to America, living with a Marine who's dealing with PTSD. He's going through a divorce he's living with his sister who lost her uh, fiance. And I'm like, what about this spells comedy? Right. But but I also loved, I think it was, I, I, one of you wrote, um, Oh, Kelly, you actually wrote on your Instagram. I saw when the show first premiered, you posted about, uh, you wrote a story about family, friendship, love, and loss about living in a time of transition and unknown about trying to understand those who are different than us and learning from one another, about standing up for what is right and following through on promises that are made, about dealing with rough times and using humor to do so. And Mm -hmm. I could so relate to that because, um, listen, there, if you live in a military family, if you're connected to the military and 
in, in the last 20 years, you've experienced some stuff. Um, yeah. you know, and some of that could be minor to, you know, again, I lost my brother and I remember it was actually the day of his funeral. I was standing in my parents' kitchen and there were a bunch of people around and somebody said something, I don't know what was said and everyone started laughing and mm-hmm. I was just kind of mortified. I'm like, we're, we're burying my brother today. How are people laughing right now? And my uncle, and I wrote about this in my book because my uncle put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I promise you, you're going to laugh again, you know? And um, it was from that moment on that I gave myself permission to say, yeah, this sucks and what I'm dealing with sucks, but it's okay to laugh and it's okay to find humor in those moments. And you guys have taken some really deep topics and you've, you've put humor to them, which can almost humanize them and reach such a broader audience. So uh, Kelly, for you, you know, tell us about, again, I loved that post, but expand (laughs) on that a little bit and what it meant for you to be a part of a a comedy that did have all those layers to unfold. Yeah. I think actually when I posted that, I was even kind of making the correlation between what we're all going through right now in the middle of a pandemic um, and to what the show's talking about. It's something that if you are a part of the military world and that family, all of those things click for you and that's something you can relate to. But it's also broader than that. It's just the human experience that we're all going to go through loss and love and having to understand uh, people with different experiences that we all come across. It's kind of a, um, a universal human truth. Um, but that's kind of how I would describe the show when I would tell people about it before it did come out. I'm like, yeah, so it's about a translator and comes to America and it's a Marine and he's going through a lot of things. And my character, we're going through a divorce and, and you go through all of it. I'm like, but it's a sitcom comedy. <laughs> like, I know, I know that sounds crazy, but it is. And that's kind of one of the things that also drew me to the script, similar to Liz, is that I actually originally also auditioned for Lizzie, for the sister. And, um, one of the audition scenes was a real dramatic in the feels scene, which is something you don't normally get to do, especially in an audition for a sitcom. They want to see bam, bam, bam. How can you hit the joke? Mm -hmm. Um, So to see a comedy that allowed you to settle in these real parts of life and actually dive into the emotion and, um, and to show that that's also part of it. Yes. The comedy is a great way to deliver it and a great way to have um, America be able to consume it. And then we get to slide in these moments of um, reality is kind of what it is. And sometimes that is dramatic and sometimes that's sad and sometimes it does have levity. Um, But yeah, that was something that kind of drew me to this whole thing. And then when they called me back and said, actually, we want you to come in for the wife, I kind of took a 180 at it. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is a completely different aspect of this show that I didn't think about before. And that's kind of been a gift for me to get to explore the other half of this world. We're really in Riley's family. I'm really in Al's story and what they went through. But then there's also sometimes these stories And these people that fall to the wayside or become collateral or, um, you know, kind of get wrapped up in it that from face value, we don't necessarily think about when we think about military and military families. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. (laughs) Um, Did you guys do anything to prepare for your roles? I mean, when, when you're told I'm going to be the sister of a Marine that's dealing with some stuff and, and I'm a, essentially a gold star fiance. Um, what did you do to, to say, okay, what does that mean? How do I prepare for that? I did a lot of uh, internet research. I mean, thank God for it being 2021 and everything's out there on the internet and found yeah. some, some beautiful stories in particular. Um, I think the one that that stuck with me the most was uh, this series of letters that were published in Cosmopolitan, I wanna say in 2005. 
um, between a, a woman and her fiance who, who unfortunately lost his life in Iraq in 2004. And God, they were just so beautiful. Just, and, and I was, I was first of all struck by her willingness to put that out into the world, um, to share that with people, to share that incredibly intimate part of her, just so people could see just how, first of all, how, um, how giddy and how um, almost uh, like childlike it was for them to write letters, you know, probably for the first time in the relationship, but also just how normal and every day, like I went to the store today, I got my dress today, I'm so excited to marry you. And, and his responses of, you know, it, you know, this kind of sucks, I'm getting two to three hours of sleep a night. And, and just the, the everyday, reality of what it is to have that relationship over time and space and war and conflict. And it was just so beautiful to read. And of course, um, the outcome is, is so sad and, uh, and even published a few of his letters that she got after she found out he was gone and they just kept coming. And it just really struck me and how, um, I don't know, I guess how, what I took from that is just how how normal it is. I don't know. There's, there's, it's such an extraordinary thing to send a loved one into a, a battle zone, but it's also thousands upon thousands of people do this every day and they continue to talk to each other and they continue to have lives and, and these milestones in their life and sharing that with them. And I don't know, it was just, it was just a, a, a good uh, gravitational point for me with Lizzie. I think that's a good, way of putting it because, you know, again, I remember when, when my brother was deployed, I was opening up my first clothing boutique at the time and he would call me and we would talk about like what lines I got into the store, you know? Yeah. Oh, oh, that sounds cool. Oh yeah. Save me one of those obey t-shirts. Yeah. I'm going to want like, <laughs> these are the conversations we're having when he's, right. you know, thousands yeah. and thousands of miles away in a war zone in Iraq. But like, that's what he wanted to be talking to me about. And so mm -hmm. that's what I was going to talk to him about. And, you know, you, you kind of put it out of your head. I always say that, you know, people will ask me if I was um, scared when Travis was deployed and he deployed twice to Iraq. And I always say I wasn't. And I wasn't at the time when he was there, I knew that men and women were giving their lives, but the ratio of men and women giving their lives to those coming back, it was yeah. like that needle in the haystack type situation. And I, again, maybe it was a coping mechanism, but I was like, it's not going to be my brother and there's no, no way something's going to happen to him. So, you know, because you hear a lot of times, well, you had to be somewhat prepared. And I'm like, no, you're never prepared. Like, yeah just like a police officer's wife is not prepared when he leaves on patrol that he may not come back. Like you're not prepared. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even though their, their job is one that, that is dangerous. Um, but you know, it, again, when you, I watched the one episode last night where you lost um, your fiance's dog tags mm -hmm. and um, you know, right now within the series, you're seeming, your character's a little lost, right? You're, you're, yeah. you're definitely in that trying to figure it out phase. And, and it was funny because as I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, I mean, my best friends are, are gold star spouses. The vice president of our organization is a gold star spouse. And mm -hmm. I was watching your character thinking like, oh, I know that phase. And, mm -hmm. um, and, but then I was thinking, I can't wait to watch how this character progresses because yeah. I know the magic in the phases that can come next and um, yeah. the, the growth that can come from making the right decisions. And, you know, so it, yeah. it was exciting to see, and I'm glad they put it into perspective that you weren't in this great place and, you know, you kind of have to work through it. Um, so I thought that was, that was great. And then Kelly, with your character as the wife, um, mm -hmm. some of the stuff that struck me was just kind of where you are, were relative to dealing with, you know, a husband that is dealing with some stuff 
right? And yeah. um, there was, I, I think it was, I watched all three episodes. I think it was the last episode, or maybe it was the second episode where you disclosed that you're dating someone. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you talk about that individual was there for me when you gave birth to your child, mm-hmm. because clearly your husband was deployed at the time. And yeah. I know hundreds of women who have given birth to, um, you know, their, their children when their husbands are deployed. Without their husband. And, mm-hmm. and, and so I loved these little moments that I'm like, this is stuff that really happens. And I think yeah. the average person who is not connected to the military to hear something like that, like, well, wait, wait well, why wasn't he there? You know, I mm-hmm. knew right away. It was like, well, he was deployed. And, you know, you start to pick up on these things of like, oh, this is what a military lifestyle and a military community is like. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's so interesting too, because Vanessa got to have Riley come back home. It's kind of like the alternate alternate universe for Lizzie and her fiance. Um, she got to have him come back home and they're still together and, and you know, he made it, but together physically, but um, that doesn't necessarily just mean that everything's fine and dandy. And it is a hard line to play because you also don't want um, to seem ungrateful for those things, having this girl right here who's suffering and she doesn't even have her person. Vanessa has her person, but there's so much more to it. Um, And kind of going back to uh, doing research and things, I really dove into a lot of military wife support groups on the internet, which is also so awesome that in 2021 that we have that, you can connect with people all over the world with very similar experiences. Um, but the fact that you don't know what you're signing up for and maybe Liz, when she got engaged to him, she knew what that world was because her brother was a part of it, but you're not ever prepared for what could come. And I think similar to even wives who are dealing with their significant other being gone, you know, big scope, what that looks like, but you have to be prepared for those moments of, are you okay with your husband not being there for the birth of your child? Are you okay with? then necessarily raising your kids kind of like a single mother. These are all things that you might not think about going into it, or you might, but still doesn't mean that you're prepared for it or that you knew what you were signing up for, or that you're okay then just picking up your life and moving across the world because that's what the military is requiring your spouse to do. Um, Yeah, I think there's a lot of struggles that come with it that I'm so happy that we're able to shine the light on because he wasn't there when she had her kid and this other person was um which is kind of a (laughs) uh (laughs) makes for a good tv moment um but yeah it's really interesting to kind of dive into that rationale I don't think that anyone who knows that their person is away wants to be any more of a burden on them so there's a lot of independence that's having to happen back home too um but sometimes that does open the door for other relationships, whether that be romantic or not, but for people at home um, needing to step in and it creates quite a conundrum when the spouse does come back, there's almost this whole other life having to be built without them. And that's kind of what Riley and Vanessa are dealing with how to navigate that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I always say, you know, my, my dad's a retired Colonel in the Marine Corps. So I, I was that kid that moved every two years. I, you know, Mm -hmm. I, and I never, ever appreciated what my mom did as a military spouse until I was older. And I look back at the sacrifices Mm -hmm. that she made and the things she did to keep our family connected. And it's unbelievable. And military spouses are the unsung heroes of the military. Mm-hmm. They, they truly are mm-hmm. because they bear the burden. Um, but just yesterday I was with, uh, on talking with Marcus Luttrell, um, you know, lone survivor and him and his wife. Yeah. And he said something that I thought was so poignant. He said, you know, anything, cause I was talking to him a little bit about the loss of, you know, he lost so many friends and, you know, during operation red wing, he was, the only person that survived and all his friends were killed. And I said, how do you deal with that? And he said, you know, on top of what he's dealing with, he said, everything I deal with, I, I projected onto her. 
So like mm-hmm. my problems are all her problems. So imagine mm-hmm. she's taking everything on. And I thought yeah. that was so beautiful that he recognized that. Um, and, and the things that his, his military spouse, the burden that she had taken on um, in just being with him, you know? So yeah. um, it takes so an I, incredible, incredible, strong person to be able yes. to. Yes, to do that. <laughs> for sure. And, you know, what, another thing that I loved was, and it wasn't, wasn't by, uh, or it was by chance, I would say, it, it clearly was just something that was coincidental, was this show starts, it's about an Afghan translator, and right at the same time, we announced that we are pulling all of our troops out of Afghanistan. And- yep. The big thing with that is that what happens to all these Afghan translators. And so it's like this perfect moment where you can show the the humanness because I I don't know, I I feel like the average American, if you say Afghan translator, they're like, well, what's that? I don't don't Mm -hmm. know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. But here's a Mm -hmm. show that's showing that, right? And is depicting, this is what an Afghan translator is. And there are going to be, uh, thousands of them left behind to their own, you know, dangers. If we just pull out, like we can't leave them behind. And, um, I know for you, Liz, that, that was something that is super important to you. And, and you're actually advocating, you've gotten involved in the policy side of that. Like, talk to me a little bit about what that means to you. I mean, it's certainly something that I was not aware of before I got involved with this show. Like you said, I think Peripherally, maybe I was aware of this being a problem, but with this show and with the um, our, our writers, Maria and, and Dave, they have been in close contact with No One Left Behind, a amazing organization that is doing a lot of advocacy work to make sure that, like you said, 17,000 Afghan interpreters and their families, that's just the interpreters, not including all of their families who are also being targeted by the Taliban and and you're right as as we start to to draw down our troops over there and whatever you may think about that policy decision um this this promise was made to these people if you help us if you help our troops we will have your back we will give you a special immigrant visa we will get you to safety and Unfortunately, it's, you know, it's an insane process with a lot of paperwork and it's understaffed and, you know, we could go on and on and on. And here we are, what, six months away from kind of a crazy deadline. So um, we are all, all of us, so, so proud of the opportunity that we have with this show reaching upwards of 5 million people an episode um, to, to educate our viewership that this is a problem, that it is urgent, and that there's something that you can do right now. You can call your senator, call your representatives, um, get in touch with the the great people at No One Left Behind. um, And maybe if we make enough noise, uh, we can, we can speed up the process a little bit for these, for these heroes. Yeah, I just think we feel feel really lucky that all the stars aligned at this time when we're able to bring light to this because same with Liz I wasn't necessarily aware of this situation so the fact that then the show can bring light to that in five six million homes in America every week is phenomenal I've already had people from both sides of the aisle reach out just going wow like I had no idea or even something wow I can't believe that we're letting this happen And just knowing that now those conversations are happening in people's minds and these people are being thought about and -hmm. they're not hopefully going to be forgotten. That's huge. I mean, it's very rare as an actress, especially in like the comedy realm to feel like you're doing some big good in the world. And if something, if we can get over a portion of those people, we've known that like that's a success alone, you know, regardless of the show, but just to get people aware of this and hopefully make a change is uh, it's a really, really cool thing to, to be a part of. And I, I hope that we can help even in a small way. Yeah. 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 I think it's um, again, another kind of testament to the power of um, this show being a, 
sitcom, right? Mm -hmm. And how it's educating, right? How it's educating so many different ways. And it was actually, someone said to me, entertainment is education. And, you know, we have to be really cognizant of what we put out there and what are the messages. And, and, and they were talking specifically around um, the military. And, mm. you know, if, if we are not putting shows like this out there, if we are not putting um, the military community at the forefront uh, in the entertainment industry, then it's just, it's out of sight, out of mind. So yeah. It's important for us to keep telling these stories in all different genres. You know, you've got yeah, Band yeah. of Brothers on one end, you've got United States of Al on the other, you know, but you have to have <laughs> yeah. those things, right? And, yeah. and who would have thought that as you guys are premiering the show, uh, it speaks to one of the biggest things that's happening right now within our country and the drawdown of troops in Afghanistan directly affecting the translators. Um mm-hmm. That is the yeah. star of United States of Al. I mean, it's wild. And um, that was that was something that was really personal to me because mm-hmm. after Travis was killed, um, his Iraqi interpreter uh, came to visit us in uh, Pennsylvania and he spent mm-hmm. New Year's Eve with us and he was over here on a temporary visa and um, Travis had written him the letter uh, to get that visa just days prior to him being killed. And so I saw him coming over here and, um, you know, and I, I still text with him to this day. I'm not going to share too much about him, but he is Mm -hmm. doing really well. And, um, and he's incredibly grateful for the opportunity to be over here because, um, he was a translation translator that was very front facing, um, and was targeted um, a- after afterwards, and so it was important for him to find safety and and to be over in the United States. I know how grateful not only was to my brother for for writing that letter, um, but to the United States for upholding the promise that they made um, mm-hmm, when yeah. he took this role. Um, and and he's a little bit older now, but he was nineteen years old when he came over here, 19 year old kid, you know, and, um, and he's created incredible opportunities for himself. So I feel super strongly about this and, you know, I'm just, I'm going to throw it out there just so it's out in the universe, but, you know, ending some of these episodes, maybe with a nice, no one left behind PSA on the back end. Um, wait for episode six. (laughs) Oh, okay. There you go. Yes. Yes. The, yes. Our episode six is, um, really dives into this subject and really um, puts a light on it and exactly what the translators go through. Um, I was going to say, what a cool kind of legacy for your brother to now have, to have this person over here continuing on because of him. That's really, really cool. Well, And and I know, you know, one of the things that was so powerful for us um, was after Travis was killed, it was not just the Marines that he served with that were sending us letters and, you know, Mm -hmm. calling us. It was the Iraqis. I mean, Mm -hmm. we had just as much correspondence from the Iraqis that he served alongside with because my brother's role was one to help train the Iraqi army. And so the bonds that he formed with those men were important and they meant something. And, you know, again, we were over there to help them and so I'm, I'm all about it. Like, we're not yeah. going to leave them behind yeah. when we leave. And regardless of whether you think we should be leaving fully or not, that's not the issue for me. And, you know, that's not something yeah. I want to argue or get into. But whatever happens, we have to make sure we take care of, of, of these young men um, that were really there stepping up for us for the last 20 years. Um, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. Absolute heroes. And, and yeah, those, those friendships, I think it's another aspect of, of these, these wars that people don't think about that there are real lasting relationships that are being forged in the most insane circumstances. And yeah, seeing the, the friendship develop with, with Alan Riley and how, how close it is. It's just, once again, just something that I didn't ever think about. And now we get to delve into mm-hmm. with the show and, and it's just, I think it's really special. 
All right, I'm going to ask you about, go, guys both uh, kind of this open-ended question. What is the, Liz, we'll start with you. What is the most interesting, weird, um, unusual thing that you didn't know about the military or the military community before joining this show? Anything that struck you? Anything that you were like, hmm. Yeah, well, th this is a maybe a fun one. Uh, and it, a delightfully surprising uh, tidbit. <laughs> um, so we got a challenge coin from one of our writers and I was not aware of what a challenge coin was until it was uh, explained to me. And for anyone listening, I'm sure everyone listening knows exactly what a challenge <laughs> coin is, but just in case, um, and please correct me if, if I get any of this wrong, um, it, if you are at a bar and you challenge everybody and say, do you have your challenge coin? Yeah. Anybody who doesn't have their challenge coin with them buys everybody a drink. And if everybody has their challenge coin, then the person who did the challenging has to buy everybody a drink. Yes, there's a couple different, generally, yes. There's a couple different <laughs> ways. Like I think the way the challenge coin started was actually like, it used to be high ranking um, military officials would have challenge coins. So okay, um, great. up to the president, like I have, I have Obama and George Bush's challenge coin. So if oh, I pulled so that cool. out at the bar, that trumps everything, right? I've got a president's yes. challenge coin. But yes, uh, the, the premise is, yes, it's, it's, it's all, it's all about drinking and pulling out the bar. Do you have your challenge? <laughs> I'm going to grab just real quick because it's right behind me and I have to show <laughs> And I have to, I have to shout out Josh Katz, who is um, one of our writers and uh, a veteran himself um, on the show, who gave us our first challenge coin on the set. Um, and it has, you know, United States Val season one. It's a, ve it's a very, very special kind of, you know, wrap gift. I love that. So this is, this is the okay. Travis Mannion Foundation challenge coin. Okay, that's dope. Wow. That looks, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really dope, cool. <laughs> and then on the back. Um, it says, if not me, then who, which is our, our motto. But um, I'll make sure really I, get, cool. I get a couple of these sent out to you girls. So you have, uh, awesome. have another challenge coin. And then you have, to get, so you have to get the challenge coin holder because then it gets real, all of a sudden you have, I mean, I've got stacks and stacks of challenge coins and, and you can go online and it's wild. You can get these challenge coin holders. It's, it's a big thing, but I love it's that you know that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And that's, that's I was just going to say, I have mine. I have mine in the office. I should probably be keeping it on me all the time. Ooh, and yeah, the like, I can stick in like we challenge yeah. each other. Right now. There Make sure I always have it. <laughs> so, so Kelly, what did what was something for you? Oh gosh, um, I mean, I don't necessarily think I didn't know it, but it's um, funny when we actually think about it. Just how much. Um, the people in the military are so regimented. We have a few jokes about when that comes home that doesn't disappear whether or not you're coming home to um your parents house your parents garage uh your own home the way that your bed has to be made every morning there's a few jokes in the show we talk about um trying to help Riley with his laundry and not folding it right not pressing it right I think that was just something <laughs> that you don't think about it they all kind of come home with this um regiment that they're that was what they lived by that was necessary to them every day if you didn't do that you were in uh, big trouble and so it's something that just becomes so ingrained and, and I really think it's kind of a bonus um to also watch you'll see in the show how, kind of how Riley implements that with Hazel but how that just becomes part of your life and who you are uh I think that the little kind of quirks of that that you wouldn't think about they're kind of funny I'm like oh yeah he would be very particular about how things are folded or put away, or I don't know. I think that kind yeah. of stuff is funny. <laughs> yes. Well, regiment is a, a big thing in the military. Yes. So yes, um, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's very true and hard not to adopt some of those, those practices. Exactly. Sure. So I love talking to both of you and I know we really focused a lot on your characters and the show. Um, but this podcast is called The Resilient Life. And it's all mm -hmm. about how you build resiliency. Um, I, I'm 
moving more towards clearly the characters that you're playing are, are resilient women. And I think it's awesome that you chose to dive into those roles um, and play these, these parts. Uh, you know, I thank you again, as a, as a sister of a fallen service member, as the daughter of a retired Marine, um, granddaughter of, uh, you know, lots, lots of military <laughs> in my family, let me put it that yeah. way. But, but beyond that, in your everyday life, the way I like to close out each, each of these episodes is I love to know what it means to you to live a life of resilience. Because like you said, like none of us are going to escape tragedy or overcome, like we all are going to have stuff in our life that we're dealing with. And mm. you guys are just playing women that are dealing with stuff that is centered around the military. But at the end of the day, we're all going to experience loss. We're all going to experience some suffering. And so um, how do you deal with that? What does living a resilient life look like for each of you? Wow. I mean, I, I think for me, uh, it's holding on to myself, um, which is a very broad way of putting, um, knowing what is important to you and, um, effectively separating things like your career sake, because, um, in, in our line of work, I think your career can very quickly overtake every part of your life and can seem like the most important, all consuming thing. Um, but taking, being able to take a step back from that and surround yourself with the right people, um, the right support system and, and, and yeah, just to recognize that life, life is bigger than what you do for a living and, um, and to appreciate, uh, nature and to appreciate your family and, or whether that's your blood family or your chosen family. Um, and especially in the past year, I mean, Kelly touched on this a little bit, but I think the COVID-19 pandemic certainly locked that in for me in a big, big way. Um, I, I know I know who my people are. I know what's important to me. And if that stays your center, I think you can get through just about anything. I love it. I think a resilient life is gonna, might sound a little cheesy, is to get up every day and brush your teeth. Um, not because I'm big on hygiene, but just because there are some days you don't wanna get out of bed and do anything. There are days, especially over exactly this past year where you almost felt like, what's the point? Sitting at home. I'm not doing anything. Those can all melt into each other. It can be the same after something as big as a tragedy where all you want to do is do nothing, disappear into nothingness. Um, and then there's even, to compare it, the, you know, in our line of work, if something doesn't go your way or you had a bad day about audition, something got canceled, something like that, um, it's really easy to just think, I don't want to keep going. I don't want to keep doing this. And I think a resilient life to me is just keep going, whether or not that means going out and getting it, like signing up for another acting class and being super productive, or that means just getting up that day and brushing your teeth and feeling like you're still making progress to move forward. Um, Cause that's sometimes something I struggle with. You know, there's just days you don't want to do anything. And, so, and if I get up and I go, no, just brush your teeth, then that leads to me washing my face, getting dressed, maybe going on a walk. And it's just the little baby steps that keep you going. And that's being resilient. <laughs> 100%. One of, one of the hashtags I lean on heavily on Instagram is keep going. You know, mm -hmm. every, not every day is going to be good and yeah. some days are going to be crappy, but you got to keep going. And that's yeah. how you build your resilience, you know, and that's how you lead to living a resilient life. So, um, yes, 100%. You nailed it. You girls have been <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm you. really excited. I had the chance to talk to you. I'm super excited to watch, continue watching United States of Al on CBS every, cause I watch it on demand. Tell me when, when does it air? What nights and what time? On Thursday on CBS at 8.30, 7.30 central. <laughs> Got it. 8.30, 7.30 central Thursday nights on CBS. Um, 
if you're, I know we've got a lot of military listeners on here. You're going to like it. You're going to find humor in it. It's going to be funny <laughs> just to see how they can take some of these serious topics and put a bit, bit of humor into it. And if you're not connected to the military world, this is a great way to kind of get a little dive into it and say, okay, this is what it's like to live in a military family and, and get a little mm-hmm. taste of what that means. And I think, again, really helping to play this role in bridging the civilian military divide and, and normalizing and not like stigmatizing. Yeah. Like they're a normal family. They're dealing with some stuff. It just happens to be in the military, but the, the divorce, the drinking, the loss, like all families have that. So yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but watch it. It's great. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing how your characters develop and progress And I thank you for taking, like, again, taking that step to play these these roles that are a little bit more complicated and, um, you know, a little bit scary to kind of dive into this world that you may not know anything about. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for joining us on another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. Thank Thank you. you so much. Thank you.